Thank you very much for coming. I hope you already had your lunch, so you're not falling <laughs> or you're not get, uh, developing too much hunger during the session. Um, yeah, thank you very much for coming, and um, I'm excited to be here with some um, very distinguished panelists. Um, they will speak one after the other uh, about their different countries and regions, and they will give a little bit of introduction before for, before they start um, before they start speaking. The the um, structure will be that everybody has about ten minutes, and we have two hours in total for this session, so I'm pretty sure we will have enough time for questions and answers after all the presentations. So maybe note down the questions while, <laughs> while, while the panelists are, are talking about the different issues. And um, I was told that I also have the privilege, uh, maybe first I introduce myself, I'm, I'm Jürgen Menz, I'm a disability inclusion officer at the, at the International Labour Organization working in the headquarters in Geneva. Um, and I was told that I also have the privilege of saying a few words at the very beginning of, although I'm, I'm also chairing this panel. Um, so, so I take advantage of that. <laughs> and I hope this works now. Let's see. I have a, just a few slides, not to, to bore you. But um, I want to talk about actually the why and how of reasonable accommodation because this year's topic of the Zero Project Conference is accessibility, right? So this is a bit of a different, well, quite a different concept, but it is equally important, I think, because if you really want to work on the inclusion of, of people with disabilities, especially in the workplace, you of course need to work on accessibility, uh, developing over time accessible workplaces, both in terms of digital accessibility, accessibility of information, uh, the built environment, but at the same time we know that this is an ongoing process and, and oftentimes we still have to provide reasonable accommodation, which is an individual, individualized uh, solution, right? So accessibility and, and reasonable accommodation go hand in hand and complement each other. And of course, the more accessible organizations, companies, spaces are, uh, the less we have to accommodate people with disabilities individually, right? So, just a few words about the why. So, basically I think there are two reasons. Of course, the human rights of, of people with disabilities and uh, the business case. Because we're talking here today about uh, reasonable accommodations or reasonable adjustment, as they're also called, in the workplace. So when you look at the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which is of course a human rights treaty, uh, we know it's, it's widely ratified, almost all countries, 170, 175 countries, uh, last time I checked, and you see there's, uh, there's reference to reasonable accommodation, and particularly to reasonable accommodation in the workplace, twice. So a general reference to, to reasonable accommodation in Article 2, and that's quite interesting because the CRPD says that the denial of reasonable accommodation is a form of discrimination. This is quite a, quite a paradigm shift because then also the, in, in national legislation it should be made sure that um, if a person with disability is not accommodated, then, then the person with a disability can take also legal action, right? And um, yeah, and, and specifically in the article on work and employment, Article 20, uh, 27, reasonable accommodation is included there. And at the same time, a little bit um, in the same vein, um, well, because I'm from the International Labour Organization, of course I speak also about international labour standards, and um, there's a specific labor standard, a convention, a legally binding convention adopted in 1983 um, by employers, by workers and governments of the member states of the ILO, which also talks about um, the term reasonable accommodation is not actually used in that convention, but it is, uh, it is the same concept that you need to take 
in a way also a type of affirmative action to include people with disabilities. But the interesting thing is that reasonable accommodation, of course, is not only a concept uh, that is used for persons with disabilities and in international labor standards. We see it also in the ILO HIV and AIDS recommendation from 2010, where there's also explicit reference to, to reasonable accommodation in the workplace for people who live with HIV or AIDS. And um, later on, I will also talk about an ILO publication we, we launched recently where we also explain or, or talk about different uh, additional social groups that benefit from, from reasonable accommodation. And in fact, I, I would say that everybody at some point in their career or their job hunt um, uh, has, has a need for a reasonable accommodation. But of course, in the context of disability, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's more common. And I said at the beginning, of course, it's, it's about human rights, but it's also the business case. And the business case, of course, helps to advocate and sensitize employers about the concept of reasonable accommodation. And uh, as I mentioned also at the beginning, reasonable accommodation is kind of complementary to accessibility, but also awareness, right? Usually when I give speeches or presentations, I say it's a triple A. It's awareness, access, accessibility, and accommodation. With these three, three A's, you're already on, on a good path to become more inclusive of, of people, people with disabilities. And when you manage to apply um, reasonable accommodation, uh, both in the, or not both, but throughout the employment cycle, that is then uh, uh, already in the recruitment phase, while you are employing people with disabilities and when you, when you retain people with disabilities, it creates a more uh, diverse workplace, right? So the whole idea or all the narrative we also use at the ILO to convince employers that uh, employing people with disabilities is, uh, makes business sense is uh, diversity of workplaces. And under that framework of diversity or diver the diverse workplaces, we see that div more diverse workplaces, more diverse companies, they are more effective in, in problem solving, they're more innovative, and they, of course, also have a more positive uh, reputation in, in society. But I also wanted to give you some numbers to back it up. And this is uh, from a study in eight US companies of varying sizes including interview with over 100 participants and um, 5,000 completed online surveys. So it's, it's quite some reliable figures there. And you see it's not only good for the employee who has been accommodated. You see, for example, there uh, 71, or almost 72 percent of employees who were accom accommodated, they say, of course, this increases the likelihood, the loyalty towards uh, the, the company and the likelihood to stay. And of course, it also decreases the level of stress at work because if I have a need for accommodation, but I can't, or there's no procedure in place, or there's no system that allows me to actually to, to be accommodated, it creates problems, it creates uh, stress at work because I feel I can't do the job like I could do because my need is not accommodated. And at the same time, uh, the first bu two bullet points on the slide talk about the positive impact managers feel, right? So they actually see, okay, it's, it's, it's about productivity um, and efficiency. I think yesterday also um, Hector from Microsoft was talking about accessibility and how it uh, has a positive impact on efficiency and productivity. And it's the same with reasonable accommodation because the whole idea is to, to make best use of your employees' productivity, of their skills and talents and so on. And for that, you also need reasonable accommodation. Right? And of course, if I see that my company takes me seriously, that they recognize my skills and, and help me to, to bring my best professional self to work, um, then of course my morale, my, my commitment to that company is also uh, growing. So it's really a win-win for, for both the employees and, and the managers and uh, the company as a whole. 
I'm clicking, but nothing happened. Oh, well, at least, uh, okay. Uh, well, one slide, and I'm about to finish, just to, just to set a little bit the scene, or, or getting it right from the beginning. I think oftentimes employers feel that, oh, reasonable accommodation, that's always like a huge financial cost, so that is, of course, sometimes like a barrier, in, like a mental barrier to think about hiring people with disabilities. So I always think that it's important to actually show the financial impact of, of reasonable accommodation, which is most of the time none. So there's no financial implication for most of the time. And you see these, these figures are taken from the US, from the Job Accommodation Network, and you see 58 percent of the times there was no financial cost whatsoever. Um, in about more than one-third of the cases there was a one-time cost which was on average 500 US dollars which is of course in the US context in, in low-income countries of course the figure would be would be much um, much lower and then only um, 5% of the times for providing uh, reasonable accommodation, there's an annual cost or a one-time and annual cost. So we need to, when we talk to employers, we also need to tell them, listen, this is not an issue of cost. Sometimes there is a cost, but most of the time there's no cost. And um, yeah, to, to get, this, get rid of this myth of, of um, huge investment, and I would even, wouldn't even call it cost, it's, it's an investment, of course, in in your employee. Um, and some propaganda, I would say, um, because of course I, I also won't, don't want to take up too much time, but uh, the ILO recently launched this guide for employers on how to promote diversity and inclusion through reasonable accommodation or workplace adjustments. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we, we took a more holistic or more inclusive approach in that guide because we said, okay, people with disabilities are, of course, one important group that sometimes needs uh, reasonable accommodation at the workplace, but similarly, uh, people living with HIV, um, also people with family responsibilities or caring responsibilities, and also people with uh, or from, from religious minorities might need reasonable adjustments uh, in the workplace so they can actually do their job and have, don't have to worry about other things, basically. And, um, and what, what the guide, of course, also says, that it's important to have a company policy on reasonable accommodation and making sure there's a, there's a well-communicated procedure in place. Everybody knows about the procedure. It actually works, and we will hear from our for our panelists, how it works in different contexts and in different companies. Um, I think one of the main points is just asking the employee, because the employee is, is the expert and knows also from non-work related areas uh, which, which kind of accommodation would work best for him or her to, to do his, her job. And ensure confidentiality, right, if, if possible. Um, sometimes, of course, a reasonable accommodation is just, I mean, obvious to everybody. But otherwise, especially when it comes to psychosocial disabilities, uh, mental health issues, where there's a lot of even more stigma attached to that, making sure that uh, that confidentiality is ensured. And in general, we feel there's, of course, quite a lack of guidance still for employers on how to provide it. So we're very, very happy that uh, we launched this guide. And um, in the corner of the room, just uh, on my right-hand side, um, you'll find hard copies of, of this guide. And you will also find it available online in English, Spanish, French. We're also working on a translation into Arabic. So we try to promote this as, uh, as, as widely as possible. And just to end, I want to show you a video of one of the authors we, we, um, we hired in the process, Mark Bell from the Trinity College in, in Dublin. And in one minute, he will give you a much better presentation on reasonable accreditation than I did. <laughs> Thank you.
First of all, flexibility in working time can be a practical way of allowing workers with family responsibilities to reconcile, for example, childcare responsibilities with work, such as adjustments to when they start or finish the working day. Secondly, flexibility in the tasks that have to be performed at work can be an important way of promoting the inclusion of workers with disabilities. For example, a worker may find it difficult to lift heavy objects and if that part of their job could be transferred to another worker then that may allow them to remain in work. Thirdly, uh, people who are living with HIV may at times be affected by fatigue so flexibility in the place where work is performed, for example allowing a worker uh, to work from home for a certain period of time or part of the working week can assist uh, there as well. Overall, uh, the, a, lot of, a lot of workplace adjustments have relatively low costs, they're pragmatic and they allow uh, the, both the worker and the employer to uh, continue a successful working relationship. I just realised I took up too much time, so I'm uh, quickly passing on the floor to Graham. Um, he worked with Channel 4 in the UK and he will actually talk about what I had also uh, touched on, the, the policies and proce procedures in a company to, to provide reasonable accommodation. Floor is over to you. Thank you, Jürgen. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Graham. Um, do I have any slides? It'd be good if I had some slides. Do I have to do anything? Oh, I could just sit here and talk, but my slides are nice. Hey, there we go. Right, thank you. So, minutes on simplifying and democratising workplace adjustments, actually picking up a lot on what Jürgen has just mentioned. So, firstly, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am a disability consultant based in the UK. Historically, I'm an IT guy, but don't hold that against me. I spent 25 years working as a programmer, analyst and project manager, and it was with my IT hat on that I started getting involved in disability in the mid-2000s when I became a pioneer in the corporate adoption of IT accessibility. And the photo there is of me back at that time in my younger self. I look, I look a little different. I think it's because I wasn't wearing glasses at the time. Um, I worked for 16 years at the UK's largest financial services provider and in that role uh, as, as a disability manager and in that role I became best known for creating a groundbreaking approach to implementing workplace adjustments and that process has now been adopted by many other companies in the UK and probably elsewhere too. I'm now working predominantly in the media sector as a consultant. My main client is Channel 4 Television in the UK. I also work with Viacom. ITV, I'm an associate of the Business Disability Forum and Open Inclusion. So my gig in life is helping employers just be brilliant at employing disabled people. So workplace adjustments. There's a saying that goes, uh, helping one person won't change the world, but it can change the world for that one person. And that's so true of workplace adjustments. Workplace adjustments are the critical factor in attracting recruiting, retaining and developing disabled talent. When you make an adjustment for an employee, that individual will feel valued, they will be more productive, they'll be better engaged and they will tell their colleagues about it. And they will become the ripples in the pond that ultimately change the company's attitude towards disability. But let's take it one step further. What if we didn't talk about reasonable adjustments, as if disabled people weren't reasonable by default, and we just talked about adjustments or workplace adjustments. What if we stopped asking disabled people to prove that they were disabled and just took at face value their statements of need? And what if we trusted our employees not to play the system, not to abuse the process, and actually just provide adjustments to anybody who has a genuine need? What would happen is that we'd make adjustments normal, not something special for special people. We would remove the stigma around disability and we would make the provision of adjustments business as usual. And that's what I mean by democratising adjustments. So how do we do it? Companies, by and large, make a great job of making it really difficult for employees to find out how to 
request adjustments, and then the process to follow to actually get them. So the old way of providing adjustments was to have a very complex process with lots of entry points, like forms you had to fill in. You had to deal with lots of stakeholders, people such as IT, um, facilities, HR, health and safety, occupational health. There was lots of toing and froing between those stakeholders. It took lots of time. You had to have multiple approvals to actually get what you needed. And ultimately, it was the employee's manager who was responsible for doing all of that on top of everything else they have to do. Oh, and then they've got to pay for it as well. Is it little wonder that getting adjustments in lots of companies doesn't happen? So the new way is so simple. It's based upon asking the employee three questions. One, are your needs basic? If so, here's a self-service catalogue that you can use to get the adjustments that you need. Two, if your needs aren't basic, do you have a health condition, physical or mental? If so, occupational health for the professionals that you need to speak with. Three, if it's not a health condition, do you have a disability? If so, there's a disability specialist who will look after you. And this is where the magic happens. It's the disability specialist's role to conduct a workplace assessment if needed. As Jürgen was saying, many disabled people know the adjustments they need. Why make them have an assessment if they already know what they need? Once the assessment has been conducted or the disability specialist understands the adjustments that are required, they take responsibility for implementing them, working with IT, HR, facilities management, occupational health, health and safety as needed. And then at the end of the process, the employer is given a passport. This is a document that states the impact of their impairment or condition um, on them at work. It lists out the adjustments that they've received. They sign it, the manager signs it. It's then a document that they can take with them from role to role, from manager to manager, and it just makes those conversations so much easier. In this simple process, the employee is empowered to arrange their own adjustments and is trusted in that process. The manager also benefits because the effort and cost of making adjustments is taken off of their shoulders. They just need to be involved and supportive. The next challenge, here we go. Hopefully people recognize this photo, is Oliver, of course, going, could I have some more, please? This is so much like employees in many organizations. Can I have an adjustment, please? I don't know what's really reasonable for me to ask, but I'm gonna try and get, I'm trying to try and ask. Forget all of that. The solution is to actually have a really clear, as Jürgen was saying, a really clear workplace adjustments policy. The policy creates a level playing field for everybody, managers and employees. And it contains the critical questions that employees and managers ask about adjustments. For example, what does the employer mean by disability? Now, in the UK, we tend to base our definition upon the Equality Act 2010, which basically says it's a physical or mental condition, long-standing nature, has a significant impact upon day-to-day -day activities. Boom, there you go. That's what we mean by disabilities. What do we mean by workplace adjustments? The things that we can provide that will enable someone to be fully productive in the workplace. The kit, changing the built environment, or doing things, as that video said, about changing working hours, something as simple as that. What do we mean by reasonable? We don't mean giving people the moon on a stick. We mean taking adjustments and actually making sure that they're effective, and we provide a definition of what we mean by it. We obviously would be implementing reasonable adjustments, but there's no reason to keep banging on about that word reasonable when you're communicating. Who do we make adjustments for? Sure, permanent staff, people you're recruiting, fair enough. What about freelancers? What about additional workers or contingent workers who are working for you? Do they need adjustments? Probably yes. And then who's responsible for making adjustments? And yes, who pays for them? Having a policy, and putting these things in black and white will create a better understanding and more consistent and fair treatment for disabled employees right across the organization. It also helps managers feel less scared about making adjustments. They're not gonna be worried about setting a precedent or being told off by their boss for making an adjustment for one of their employees. 
So these two simple steps, the process and the policy, can democratise adjustments for the benefit of all employees and the overall organisation. I would also say that what I've presented here works regardless of organisation size. I've implemented this at a company of 90,000 people. I've worked with companies as small as just a few dozen people. It works. It's simple. And I recommend you pick it up and, and run with it. I'm just going to finish on my contact slide with a... I've got a little bit of time. Oui. Mm -hmm. a, a bit of a plug. Um, yesterday, Channel 4 Television, uh, who is my main client, published um, an, uh, a guide for employers in the TV sector on employing disabled talent. I wrote that guide for them. Um, it's actually a great document for any employer. It's a one-stop shop of advice, guidance and information that presents the business and creative case for employing disabled people and how to go about doing it. Please find it, retweet it, share it. So Graham K. Whippy, my contact details are there. I commend you to actually take that document and share it with as many people as possible. And let's start changing not just TV, but the whole world of employment for disabled people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Graham. I very much like the idea of making it as simple as possible and business as usual. And I'll read the guide uh, right after the conference. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. All right, next we have uh, Catherine Johnson. Um, she's actually replacing Richard, who was on, on the original panel. And uh, Catherine is talking about, will talk about um, Disney in China and how they um, work on reasonable accommodation. Catherine. And my apologies for my colleague who was unable to, uh, to be here today. So he's a dear friend of mine, and I've known him for 17 years in our disability advocacy work in China. So I'm happy to be here in honor of him. Um, I am presenting on em employment for deaf individuals in China, and it's a case study on Disney in Shanghai. Currently, I am serving as the director of our Confucius Institute, uh, and I am part of a network of over 500 Confucius Institutes globally in more than 140 countries. The primary mission uh, of our Confucius Institute is to teach Chinese language and culture and promote an understanding of China all around the world. However, our Confucius Institute, because of my background as a special ed teacher and a professor, a professor in our Department of Special Education, I bring with me also a core value of advocating for people with disabilities. And so uh, pro promoting this core value in all the Confucius Institutes globally is a vision of mine. And so thankfully this week I was able to meet with the director of the Confucius Institute at the University of Vienna. He is here. Thank you, Richard, for coming today. And I see that as part of our efforts uh, for addressing uh, the sustainable development goal of building partnerships in, uh, around the world in advocacy. Specifically for me, it's with China. In relation to what my colleague Richard is doing, uh, we have a nonprofit organization and have developed this work collaboratively over the last number of years. In China, there are an estimated 85 million people with uh, disabilities, officially. We say officially because there are still a lot of hidden people in China with disabilities, and so the numbers are a rough estimate. 21, or 25 million people have a physical disability, and when we talk about accessibility, it's hard in China for those 25 million people who have a physical disability. 21 million people are estimated at being deaf, 12 million are blind, 4 million have a mental or cognitive disability, and 25 million have a severe or profound disability. In the area of employment, 9 million have jobs, we say, and estimated 5 million are what we call fake jobs. And I'm embarrassed to even use that word fake coming from the United States. But uh, pseudo jobs, I'll switch it out with pseudo jobs. Uh, the official government of, the, of China has um, has been working hard on accurately identifying these numbers. In Shanghai, there are 15 million Shanghai official residents, according to the census of 2016. 500,000 have an official disability registered. 93,000 have jobs, but again, 50,000 have an estimated pseudo job or a welfare job, and of those, 50,000 are deaf. China's disability welfare privatized shifting welfare costs. 
This is where it gets interesting in China, uh, is that businesses are required by law to hire people with disability, 1.5 to 1.7% of their workforce. Alternative, though, is to pay a fine equal to uh, the business payroll of what those individuals would be for not meeting this target. And this is adjusted for each person with a disability that is actually hired, that is not a pseudo-employee. So the formula that is currently endorsed by the Chinese government, the number of employees times the average annual salary times 1.6, and then that's where the cost is for the companies. And just as a point of reference, if you're not familiar with China's monetary system, one US dollar equals about 6.35 RMB. That was as of this morning. So here are the examples uh, to put that formula into a visualization for you. I'll just ask, or do the top one for you. If you have 100 employees in a company and each average annual salary is 100,000 RMB, and you times, that, uh, times the 1.6 fine, that's how much the annual fine is for a company. But when you take it out, there are a lot of companies in China that have a lot more people that are paying this fine rather than actually hiring someone. So uh, for this, the entry level, employee with a disability. You can see what these numbers are also. And if you hire someone who actually costs five or 50,000 RMB, that's their average annual salary, the fine abatement per employee, 100,000 RMB that they do not have to pay, and an average net annual savings per employee then equals 50,000 RMB. We kept the numbers simple for the example, but this is really what is happening. So the question is, many American companies in America do have inclusive workforces, including people with disabilities. So why do these same companies not have inclusive workforces in China? Something gets lost across the ocean. These are the possible reasons based on our last 18 years of work in China. For one, maybe there actually are sufficient applicants with no disabilities, and so their workforce uh, demand isn't met. The other, though, is companies may not know how to find qualified applicants with disabilities. Where do you find them? How do you interview and evaluate applicants with disabilities? How do you train and support staff with disabilities? No one is offering a one-stop solution or bridge for this goal. So it's much easier for the international companies right now to pay the fine. However, what uh, my colleague Richard is working on in Shanghai is this one-stop shop approach where he is working with companies. The lead company right now, the model company that I'll share more details on, um, is consulting on an action plan for the company, like what you had shared. It's a very good presentation, thank, thank you. you. Uh, accessibility, what kind of a support will be needed for these workers? The HR training, knowledge, uh, and leadership within the corporation. Providing with pre-screened port of applicants with disabilities. So this is what this one-stop solution is providing currently. Training programs for the supervisors. How do you ensure that the individuals with disabilities are respected within the workforce of the company? And support for the marketing and branding and sustainable profit profitability for the company. So the prerequisites for a partnership with my colleagues Richard's um, program that he is developing. We need leadership within the top management to believe in this and to see the vision and value the contributions that individuals with disabilities hold for contributing to an, an organization. Companies that are successful, successful in hiring and supporting people with disabilities in the U.S., they already know how to do this and have a model in the U.S. We just need to help provide the services within the context and culture of China. Companies with large number of mostly entry-level jobs that fit undereducated Chinese workforce with disabilities. Regretfully, we all know a contributing factor, factor to the lack of employment is low education or lack of education. And so how do we still help these individuals reach their full potential and become contributing members of society? So the business case, why hire people with disabilities? The financial net savings within the context and culture of China, it reduces the fine. It's as simple as that. So if we can show the economic uh, model and benefit, it helps in shifting the attitudes. 
high quality, low, loyal employees with excellent retention. This is something that all of us know the research on the contributions that people with disabilities can make. Marketing and branding, corporate social responsibility for change in China, and doing the right thing, leading by example. So currently, Disney has fully embraced this model of working with individuals who are deaf. 50, last year, 50 plus deaf people with disabilities were hired. The goal in 2018 is 100 or more. And this is contributing to thousands of RMB per year that is being saved by Disney. The employees that have been, in, have been hired who are deaf are really demonstrating that they are effective contributing members of the workforce of Disney. It's creating marketing and an image brand as they lead the way within China. It's a game changer and a catalyst for change, moving and shifting corporate social responsibility from the land of the United States into the context and culture of China. And it's support and inclusion in the Disney community, the global Disney community. So that's the model that is currently being developed. Richard uh, is based in both Washington, D.C. and in Shanghai. Here's his contact information. And currently, he's working with the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai to bring in other multinational corporations to expand uh, this model that we are developing within the context and culture of China. I want to give Eric applause. <laughs> Thank you, very, thank you very much, Catherine. I find it very intriguing to hear also about this the challenge global companies have in kind of globalizing their good inclusion practices. And yeah, hopefully that, that will gain more traction in China also. Um, wait, we, we stay in Asia now, from, from East Asia to South Asia to Bangladesh. And Murtesa, uh, who is the co-chairperson co of the Bangladesh Business and Disability Network, will give an overview of the network's uh, work and how they deal with reasonable accommodations. Thank you, Montesa. Thanks, Jürgen. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, can I get the slides? Okay. Uh, so as Jürgen was saying, I'm from the Bangladesh Business and Disability Network. Um, so very uh, quickly, is this moves? Oh, there we go. So in my presentation, I'll talk to you very broadly about the Bangladesh context and then give you an introduction to our network and our activities, followed by some examples of reasonable accommodations in Bangladesh. So we're a population of about 160 million people. And uh, it's estimated that 9 to 10% of the population are people with disabilities. And an economy of almost US uh, $200 billion and growing at close to 7% a year, which is one of the highest growth rates globally. So it's a very fast growing economy right now. Um, a lot of investment coming in. And of course, we want to make sure that people with disabilities are part of that growth. The major drivers in the economy are, of course, the apparel sector, which is very well known about pharmaceuticals and other kinds of manufacturing are also taking root now, but agriculture is still our largest sector. And at the moment, of course, hard barriers, both transportational, infrastructural, um, along with the soft attitudinal barriers and negative stigma, is uh, preventing people with disabilities from getting into the workforce. But at the same time, there have been a lot of employers on the demand side and uh, supply side partners, whether they're disability organizations or NGOs and development partners, who are working on initiatives to try to change the paradigm. So um, the network was launched in December 2016, so we're fairly young, but we've had a fairly high level uh, endorsement. Our prime minister launched it along with the director general of the ILO and the president of the Bangladesh Employers Federation. And it's really an employer-led network, which is why I think a lot of employers have come forward. And this is the first time, uh, really, that employers have stepped forward for the um, disability inclusion cause in Bangladesh. And we want the network to act as a platform that's bringing together, uh, firstly, employers who want to become inclusive, those who are already inclusive, and of course, supply side partners uh, such as disability organizations, NGOs, and development partners to sort of collaborate and see how we can do that systematically. So we're facilitating a lot of knowledge sharing uh, on successful policies, practices, and of course, the challenges that are out there, raising awareness about disability inclusion and promoting the business case that we've heard about. And of course, one of our main objectives is also to create employment for people with disabilities. And next to this, we are also acting as a lobbying force with the government for inclusive uh, policies. 
Um, so till date, we have uh, close to 40 members now who are paying membership fees, and the ILO is also supporting us, which we're very grateful for. And we're holding a lot of sensitization seminars um, and training workshops for HR managers and other functional heads uh, in different cities of Bangladesh. In some cases, it's the first time companies are even considering disability inclusion. And we're also trying to highlight and promote the companies who are already doing it so that they can learn from their peers in terms of what's working and what's not. Um, we're also trying to set up partnerships with chambers of commerce, as you know, these are hubs of employers in different cities, to create also local level um, sort of ownership of the issue. And uh, for the first time, one of the chambers of commerce have started a job placement desk for people with disabilities through our sensitization work, um, and have also com uh, created a committee under their chamber of commerce for disability inclusion. Um, so certainly the dial is moving. And we're planning job fairs in different parts of the country uh, as a way to promote uh, employment. So here's some photographs from one of our, well, most successful, I guess, job fairs, our only job fair till now in the capital city of Dhaka. The most successful. The most successful. <laughs> uh, we were able to create about 150 plus jobs uh, from this one fair. You'll be happy to know the gentleman on the right was given a wheelchair by our labor secretary who was there uh, from the government. And this also is a way to showcase and raise awareness about inclusive employers. Um, to the government. Uh, the SDG coordinator was also present to ensure that they are also learning about the private sector initiatives. Here we have two of our members from our network who had booths. Grameen Phone is a local subsidiary of Telenor uh, from Norway. Um, and uh, you know, the, the role sort of multinationals are playing uh, is also important. Coca-Cola has also joined our network. And in the apparel industry, for example, uh, major brands such as Marks and Spencer from the UK have sort of uh, motivated their local uh, partner factories and companies to also work on inclusion. And they started this process uh, almost a decade ago. So though, uh, some good stories are coming out um, also through the work of multinational brands uh, locally. Um, so in terms of reasonable adjustments, um, and really disability inclusion more generally, uh, policies are very much lacking in Bangladesh. Most companies don't have a policy, um, but that is slowly uh, starting to change. Uh, some of it's also the uh, challenges you raised in terms of even finding disabled uh, applicants, mm -hmm. things of that nature. And that's why in our network we've also included NGO partners and disabled people's organizations to ensure that linkage is there between the supply and demand side. Um, so, the, so some examples that we have, um, and this is of course uh, the exception, not the norm. Our most inclusive employer has employed over 1,500 people with disabilities, most of whom are hearing impaired, and they have, for example, required their supervisor level employees uh, to be trained in sign language. Mm. Um, next we've had, an, well you can consider this more of an accessibility issue, but some companies have gone out of their way to ensure a housing and accommodation close to the work location, uh, and also transportation facilities because just getting them the job is not enough uh, in a developing country context because you have to ensure the pathway to get to work um, is also uh, cleared. Um, things like hearing aids have been provided, flexible work schedules have been offered, as well as buddy systems so that people with disabilities and uh, their non-disabled counterparts can also uh, support them in case of uh, any requirements. Also some tailored work make ad or workspace adjustments, whether it's adjusting uh, the work area and designated officers to manage these adjustments. Uh, in some cases, uh, work locations have been changed. Um, a lot of buildings aren't accessible. So for example, moving the workspace to the ground floor or giving access to elevators uh, where they're available. And of course, uh, washrooms being made accessible and uh, drinking fountains, etc. Because often uh, people with disabilities, even before they leave the house in Bangladesh, have to think, where am I going? Am I going to be able to have a washroom there? And will I have to regulate even how much I drink before I leave the house? Um, so employers are starting to think about these things. Um, and here are some photographs of some reasonable adjustments. As you can see, work tables uh, that have been adjusted here, uh, mostly in the apparel industry again. And finally, this is the story of Mr. Muhammad Alamin, who was born with a club foot. And he tried to get a job at many factories, but uh, in different companies, but you know, the door was shut on him many times. Still, finally, an apparel industry uh, called Vintage Denim decided to give him an opportunity. 
and uh, they adjusted the workspace for him. He's even started his own family now. And we're hoping through our network, we'll be able to open many more doors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mortez. And uh, the, the very last slide is so important, not to always break it down to the human level and see how, how a reasonable accommodation for, for a disabled person can really change this person's life. And you said he started a family apparently after he got the job, right? So it's really amazing. And, and we, as ILO, we also promote always a Bangladesh Business and Disability Network as a good practice in terms of having national networks of inclusive companies that are a platform for companies to share their practices, to, to share their lessons learned, their challenges. And I think it's also, also always a good place to, to, yeah, for companies to learn from each other also about how they deal with reasonable accommodation, right? What, what, what policies are already in place? How can we adapt it in, a, in, a, in another um, company? So thank you very much, Mortesa. We, um, we still stay now in, in uh, South Asia. Uh, but uh, extending it a little bit to India and Nepal too. And uh, Monica will tell us a, bit, a little bit about uh, also the area of job matching and how adjustments are, are needed there to bring people with disabilities in, into the workforce. So Monica, thanks. Hi. Um, it's wonderful to hear the stories that are coming through uh, and very consistent messaging and experience throughout the world on workplace accommodations. I'm Monica Ackerman and in my day job I'm the digital accessibility lead at Scotiabank, uh, driving uh, digital and uh, creating digital ex experiences for our customers and employees with disabilities and I've had many years of experience in workplace accommodations in uh, large and small sectors. I'm here today uh, representing a passion of mine which is uh, work uh, uh, opportunities for persons with disabilities in working on a project with the Disability Rights Promotion International. Uh, Disability Rights Promotion International is a collaborative project to establish a comprehensive, sustainable international system to monitor the human rights of persons with disabilities and has projects on six continents. This particular project, the Asian Workplace Approach that Respects Equality, or EWARE, builds on the work of DRPI to identify and address the barriers that people with disabilities experience when trying to participate in the labor force, in particular in uh, Dhaka, Bangladesh, Kathmandu, Nepal, and Hyderabad, India. It's a collaboration between York University, Global Affairs Canada, and disabled persons organizations in each city. The DRPI monitor, so the project, um, in year one of the project, uh, utilized the DRPI monitoring methodology to help us to understand the systemic reasons for underemployment and for unemployment of persons with disabilities in these countries, and also to understand some of the economic opportunities for working age people uh, with various types of disabilities. Uh, in year one, we hired more than 50 people with disabilities to conduct, uh, train them in how to conduct uh, rights monitoring and they provide, conducted research and participated in helping to set the direction for the project by monitoring the system. So what do the governments do or do not do to protect, promote and fulfill the right to work? The media, what does the media say about the employment of persons with disabilities? And most importantly, the individual experiences through, of persons with disabilities and their employment uh, opportunities or lack thereof through interviews and focus groups. Um, DRPI takes an innovative approach to ensure that inclusive uh, workplaces become inclusive. Um, the key strategies are some of which have already been spoken about here, building knowledge, so uh, working with employers, uh, building employer networks, uh, celebrating the champions of inclusive employers, um, bridging the gap, so actually connecting uh, people with disabilities, with skills that job uh, places require in order to be uh, competitive. And to date, we've connected with over 400 employers and helped secure work for over 200 people with disabilities in these cities. And these positions are in various private, public sector, uh, private and public sector in various industries and sizes of company. 
we have learned lessons along the way. This is the fourth year of the project, um, and really it's crucial to avoid some the disincentives. And what is that? Some of the things we discovered is that often the employment supports in this area focus on the need to rehabilitate and to train individuals with disabilities to better fit the labor market, such as resume writing, job readiness training. You can write very many resumes over your life and never actually secure sustainable employment. Um, all of this places the onus of responsibility on the individual as opposed to looking to societal norms, values and practices that can be mod modified to better include persons with disabilities in the workplace. So we concentrate, instead of concentrating on the supply side, the job seekers, we focused on the demand side. Um, Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, in his recent book, uh, Hit Refresh, he says, he says, we can no longer settle for supply side excuses as reasons why women are not represented in the workplace. We argue the same applies for people with disabilities in our workforce. Um, so we turned around the training and began to focus on our employers. We held numerous workshops that covered many of the, uh, much of the information Graham shared with us. Uh, the CEOs, uh, workshops particularly for the CEOs and the leaders of the companies, they set the tone. They want to, and need to understand the business case and how to include persons with disabilities in the workforce. They in turn provide direction and funding um, and support to uh, managers and to the HR departments where we would have uh, workshops with the HR staff with sessions that were much more tactical in nature and talked about recruitment and hiring and workplace adjustments. Um, in finding oops, there we go, the right candidate for the jobs, really it's a bit of a puzzle. We have workplace coordinators in each of the cities and uh, what they do is they help to develop and maintain relationships with employers and with uh, and, uh, disabled persons organizations and people with disabilities. We connect uh, job seekers with jobs and, uh, cre and provide the right supports for both the employer and the, em and the employee in order to, uh, uh, at their workplaces. So how does it come together? Well, our workplace coordinators are always looking for opportunities. Uh, I was in Hyderabad and we had a break in between meetings and went into a store and within five minutes our workplace coordinator came out and said, come, 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 you have to come and meet. I've, I've met the HR director and I've talked to him about some open jobs that he has, looked at the skills and within 24 hours had somebody um, uh, on the slate ready for a job. So it's just being very open about uh, your projects and just positive in creating and celebrating these champions. Um, once we have an idea about the, what the job is, it's about matching this and making the match between an individual's skill uh, and the particular task that a job requires is the foundational uh, piece of our work. Uh, we encourage employers to look beyond disability and gender stereotypes and really see the person and the skills that they're going to be able to bring to this particular job. Without a good job match, no amount of accommodation is going to create a successful employment outcome. Um, being able to identify uh, the skills is most important. And in uh, many of the situations that we find, people have limited access to education, skill building, training, and employment opportunities. And so our workplace coordinators work very much in discovering the transferable skills. Everyone has the capacity to work. Everyone has skills that they can bring to a workplace. So we want to understand the types of jobs people want and the types of skills they do. Um, for example, uh, uh, there was a woman who came in a couple of times and was interested in work and was really the workplace coordinator spent a lot of time, you know, what education do you have, what skills do you have? And she was unable to articulate anything um, uh, with, with confidence and saying, yes, I can work. Um, and uh, they were about to say, well, I guess, I guess we can't find anything. So at um, the end of the interview, uh, the workplace coordinator complimented the woman on, on the sari, the beautiful sari that she was wearing. And she says, oh, I make all the clothes for my whole family. And so she wasn't even aware that this was a skill, a transferable skill that she could bring into her workplace and what we were able to make a job match for her. Um, 
So the other half of the puzzle is you really have to understand the job requirements. Job descriptions don't usually do that. Uh, they're very broad and they're generalized and you need to understand the very specifics. Um, and we do that by meeting with the employer, by visiting the workplace, by understanding what some of the environmental issues there are either in the workplace or in getting to the workplace, and by building uh, accommodation plans or, as Graham said, passports for an individual for that particular task. Now this often starts at the recruitment stage. Um, interviews, if the workplace isn't accessible, we'll find an accessible workplace. Taking advantage of technology for communications, using Facebook and SMS for uh, potential candidates who are deaf or hard of hearing, that's pretty standard communications. Um, Uh, transportation is very much uh, 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 an issue and accommodations need to be contextual and, and unique. So many of the accommodations that we would find in this area include working hours, um, access to transportation, um, allowing people to work at a work location that is much closer and, and much more easily accessible. Um, and and uh, employers also often pay for transportation or have shuttles for people and this is an accommodation that in, uh, in Canada where, where I work most likely wouldn't be covered. The, the onus for getting to work is the responsibility for the person um, because we have much more accessible interfaces. We also fa have found that, um, uh, that Innovation is, uh, uh, and inclusive workplaces come hand in hand. Some of our employers who uh, really have embraced inclusive employments are also very, uh, very innovative, such as Rockwell Industries. They develop solar powered freezers, um, they use renewable resources, and, uh, and are very um, uh, uh, inclusive employers. So I welcome you to take a look at a video that they had, uh, on our website about some of these amazing inclusive employer practices. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. I'm happy to hear from you that, that indeed innovative companies or inclusive companies also are inclusive companies and vice versa, right? Um, and, and you touched on, on supply and demand, and I think it's really crucial what you also mentioned that now in between the supply and demand, you also have to have a matching between the disabled job candidates and, and the company. So thank you very much. We now cross the ocean <laughs> and go to the US where um, Joseph is, is um, working at the Drake University and he will tell us about the um, lessons learned from the Harkin Summit named after the Senator Harkin in, in the US and also about the research the Harkin Institute does. So Joseph, please. Thank you, Jürgen. It's been uh an honor to sit here and, and listen to the other panelists. I've been taking notes up until the last second because I'm a constant learner and always have uh, good things that I take away from, from each of these. Uh, greetings to you all. My name is Joseph Jones. I'm the executive director of the Harkin Institute for Public Policy and Citizen Engagement at Drake University. It is a public policy think tank. So we focus our, our energy on the creation of public policy. It's not that we always want public policy. In fact, we try to put things uh, in a light where uh, changes can be made without the creation of law because it takes a long time to create laws. So if you can convince people to do things that are beyond the steps of creating legislation, uh, it's a lot easier for everyone. But we recognize that there have to be times when, when legislation is necessary and when public policy has to come into play. And we use our work to create that. Uh, greetings also from Senator Tom Harkin. Uh, he is not able to join us this week, um, but did send along his greetings and appreciation for all the work that we all do uh, to create a better place for, for everyone around the world. Um, at the Harkin Institute, we're a collection of full-time professionals uh, who are policy professionals. We have a collection of undergraduate students who work at the Institute uh, doing research and statistics and data and learning about the formation of public policy. Uh, in fact, I'm honored to be joined today by one of my colleagues who happens to also be a student. She's studying at the University of Salzburg, but Maddie Dwelly is back here. Um, and so I'm glad she could take the train over to Vienna and be with me as well. And then we have a, a small collection of uh, very experienced professionals and practitioners who are our research fellows at the Harkin Institute. 
So a little bit about where we started. Let's see here. All right. So this is Senator Tom Harkin. Um, one of the things that Senator Harkin is known for in his 40 years of experience in the United States Congress was the uh, authorship of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And he and Senator Bob Dole were the legislative sponsors in the Senate. And President George H.W. Bush, or Bush 41 as we call him, was the president who signed the legislation. So clearly a bipartisan piece of legislation. Senator Harkin served 10 years in the House of Representatives and 30 years in the U.S. Senate. And when that time was over, we decided, uh, along with his family, that we needed to be able to create a possibility for researchers, for students, for citizens, um, for the next century to be able to do research on public policy that he helped to create uh, and to continue the fight for social justice and equality uh, in our country and around the world. So that's why the Institute was established and that's why our archive uh, was the first thing that was established. So our objectives uh, focus on four policy areas that Senator Harkin um, worked on throughout his career. Um, persons with disabilities is the um, first focus that uh, came to be because of his work on the Americans with Disabilities Act. We also look at retirement security, wellness and nutrition, and labor and employment. Um, and our job is to make a better informed citizenry and also to provide facts, figures, positive research for policymakers to make decisions on creating public policy in these areas. So as I told you, part of that was to develop an archives and that 40 years of research, of legislation, of formulation of notes. I worked for Senator Harkin in the U.S. Senate, so all of my files are in our archives. Um, and so we have researchers, we have students, we have sitting elected officials who can access our collection and use that as the basis for their own research, whether it be writing academic papers or creating new legislation um, based on some of the legislation that was passed over the 40 years that Senator Harkin was in Congress. Um, and they can use us as a resource in the formulation of public policy, whether it be state or local or federal legislation. As Jurgen mentioned, one of the things that we do in our disability work is we wanted to be able to um, continue some of Senator Harkin's focus on disability policy, and particularly in the form of employment. And our board, along with Senator Harkin, said, well, what if we could build a summit to bring people together to have a, a great discussion about employment, but we would do it from a different angle. Um, as was mentioned earlier, oftentimes uh, we all get together and we, we talk about uh, employing people with disabilities, but we know that there are corporations out there that do work differently in the U.S. than they do abroad. And so we brought together corporations, academics, NGOs, microenterprises, and funders together to talk about benchmarking where we are as a global community on hiring people with disabilities and their inclusion, along with setting goals over the next several years. And I say it's a nuance or a twist in how things have normally been done is their usual lead is for the advocates to take the lead in pushing for, um, for change. And we wanted to focus on the businesses and the corporations because we knew many of them had non-discriminatory hiring practices in the US and they were multinational in nature, but they might be doing work in a country where it was okay to discriminate or ostracize persons with disabilities. And so we really wanted them to take the lead in, in leading by example and in setting standards in the other countries in which they are working in hiring people with disabilities. And so that first summit occurred two years ago, and our goal was to have 10 to 15 countries represented by 100 people. And we, we had close to 200 people from over 30 countries. And then this last year, uh, we had nearly 300 people from just over 40 countries to have that same conversation. And we partnered with um, corporations, we partnered with the Ford Foundation and the World Bank to create the summit and to set a goal of doubling um, the employment rate for persons with disabilities in the next 10 years. Um, so, like I said, we, we brought several large employers to the table, and here are some of the, the speakers and partners that were there. Um, 
Walgreens and Microsoft and Ford Foundations are all um, actively engaged in this process and actively engaged in the conversation to create more jobs, more inclusivity for persons with disabilities around the world. And we're going to continue this conversation uh, each year and, until we reach our goals. And some of the top takeaways are um, specialized hiring practices taking into account individuals' differences, uh, more transparency. Um, to simplify, don't overcomplicate the process um, and find ways to, to make those accommodations. But we also recognize that there are still some challenges and we hear that from a lot of the employers in which we uh, engage. Uh, even though research has shown the benefits of hiring persons with disabilities, uh, we still have challenges in getting them employed. Um, in fact, the employment rate is still about the same as it was in 1990 when the ADA passed, which is a little over 17%. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, for those accommodations that require a financial obligation, um, there still lacks uh, appropriation of funds or at least a creation of um, awareness that there needs to be funds set aside and budgeted for, for such things. Um, employers still have uh, attitudinal barriers toward uh, hiring persons with disabilities and um, also, as was mentioned earlier, the process for requesting those accommodations have uh, become more bureaucratic of a process as opposed to an inclusive process um, and having to prove that you need an accommodation um, shouldn't be necessary. It should be a, a statement of fact and a movement of action. Uh, and so I appreciate the slide that had the, um, the decision tree and uh, that's essentially what I do as a hiring manager. If someone says they need an accommodation, we make the accommodation. There's really, there's no middleman. Uh, and so I, I appreciate that. And then lastly, I wanted to mention our uh, two research fellows and their projects. Um, Dr. Amy Abernoff is over here. She's one of our two George H.W. Bush Disability Research Fellows, uh, along with Dr. Xuan Jing. Um, and we're doing a multi-year, multi-phase study that uh, measuring the impact of disability policy on education and employment in both the U.S. and China. Um, and to provide evidence that the benefits of employees receive from employing employers receive from employing people with disabilities far outweigh the cost of the workplace accommodations. Uh, of course, we know that, but we're doing some research to, to give it empirical evidence to, to back it up. Um, Dr. Abernoff has been working solely on vocational rehab um, programs in the United States, and Dr. Zheng has been studying deaf education programs in the U.S. and in China. They're going to link up together in China so we can keep this process going uh, over the next year and a half uh, to include a push to standardize interpreter training programs in higher ed in China because one of the barriers to employment for deaf individuals in China is that even if you're a highly educated individual who is deaf, you still have a hard time finding employment because no one's ever been professionally trained to communicate for you and that's what we're working on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. Um, just to say I'm always super inspired by hearing about um, Tom Harkin because if you have one committed political leader, you can see how much positive impact you can have uh, on the life of so many people. Um, so thank you for that. And, and you also touched on, on globalizing good practices no, of U.S. companies. And that's it's, it's a nice um, link to, to the presentation of Brenton, because Brenton from the Business Disability Forum will actually talk about um, global companies and how they can make sure that uh, reasonable accommodation and disability inclusion is taken into account in, in all of their operations. So over to you, Brent. Thanks. Thank you, Jürgen, and good afternoon to everybody. Thank you <clears throat> to my fellow panelists. So um, just like you, Joseph, I'm primarily here to learn, and there's certainly lots of learning um, from your presentations. So I'm also here to talk a bit about what we at Business Disability Forum have learned over the last 25 um, to 30 years um, about what works in terms of making workplace or reasonable adjustments. Um, and as, as Jürgen says, I'll talk a little bit about what we're starting to see uh, in terms of uh, the approaches that some of our global members are taking. And it's interesting that um, we've already heard a bit about some of the challenges of companies like um, Disney, for example, in terms of ha making their commitment a reality in the, in the other parts of the world in which they operate. So a little bit about myself before I start. I've worked as um, a disability consultant for Business Disability Forum for about 12 years now. So um, been, I've been at it for a, a, a long time. Um, a little bit about Business Disability Forum. 
We've been in existence for about 30 years now. So we were founded by Susan Scott Parker, who um, I don't see in the room today, but I know she's in, she's in the building. Um, if you haven't heard Susan speak about disability as a business issue, I encourage you to, to seek her out. Um, but we were founded about 30 years ago. Um, our aim is to work with employers to make it easier for them to recruit, to retain employees with disabilities, but also to serve uh, customers with, with disabilities. So we take a whole organisation approach uh, to supporting our members. We work with about 300 uh, companies, but I've just included a, a, few, a few kind of uh, logos here just to give you an idea of the sort of size and breadth of the companies that we work with. So um, some UK uh, government departments, some UK uh, brands, but many multinational brands as well. So in terms of some of the challenges uh, to, uh, to making or requesting workplace adjustments, so we have gathered the views of, uh, in the last 18 months or so, thousands of employees with, with disabilities um, through uh, our research uh, function, but also through our consultancy function. So we regularly survey um, or gather the views and experiences of, of employees through focus groups as part of the consultancy work that we do. And what employees tell us is uh, this is really an amalgamation. So of those thousands of views, these are the, these are the kind of common themes that come through. So often uh, employees will tell us that uh, their managers lack the skills and confidence to be able to effectively support them. Um, so managers are such a crucial part in, the, in this and not a day goes by that you, can't, you go on LinkedIn and there is always the adage or, or a version of it that people uh, don't leave their organisation, they leave their manager. So uh, managers have a, a really important part to play in supporting their, their colleagues with, with disabilities. Um, there's a comment there where an employee has said, I've been waiting six months for an adjustment. Um, that's an average of, 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 uh, of some of the, the experiences that we hear. So we hear of uh, employees who've, who've been waiting years for often quite a simple adjustment. It might be a, an ergonomic mouse or, um, or, or a chair. Um, but it's the bureaucracy that Joseph uh, alluded to in his presentation that stops that uh, from happening quickly. Uh, employees tell us that they find it harder if they require a soft adjustment, so some flexibility. So often um, the process uh, for getting a chair might be established, um, but if somebody wants uh, to work from a different location, then often the process doesn't allow for that. And going back to managers, sometimes they feel that that is maybe treating people um, differently, um, and they worry about the reaction of, of, of uh, non-disabled colleagues. Um, and that kind of moves on to the last point there that people often tell us that they're viewed negatively for doing things differently. So, for an example, if an employee has um, agreed with their manager that they will start work later and finish work to avoid um, the rush hour because they have an anxiety um, condition or they have a physical impairment that makes uh, public transport dif different, they'll report kind of negative comments from colleagues who maybe aren't aware of that uh, agreement, kind of, um, oh, well, it's nice of you to turn up today or kind of thanks for showing up and those kind of things. So there's a, a real cultural issue there as well. In terms of what we know about the uh, challenges uh, of, of the employer, so we gather um, our, our insight through the use of our, our disability standard tool. So we developed a, a, a management framework for our, our, our members to uh, measure and improve their performance on disabilities. It relates to the whole business. So we've kind of divided that up into, into 10 areas. So um, it starts with commitment, but it goes through to areas like recruitment, uh, retention, uh, through to uh, some kind of more technical areas, things like communication, premises, and ICT. So over the, over the last 15 years or so, hundreds of organizations have used this framework uh, to measure their performance, and um, part of that process involves submitting a, a submission to us where we can um, assess their performance. What we see in terms of the, the leading practice um, is that uh, adjustments is not only a process, but it's actually a, it actually underpins the whole uh, organizational approach to, to disability. So um, making adjustments is uh, the mechanism that makes it easier for people to do their job. So it's a core principle for these organizations that, that do this well. Um, adjustments isn't uh, a favor that uh, a colleague asks for, it's a service that the uh, employment provides to their uh, employees, so with that service comes things like uh, customer satisfaction surveys so that they can understand where the process might be improved. 
um, IT and premises adjustments are integrated into the uh, process that ensures a holistic approach to uh, making adjustments, but it also makes sure that that data is wrapped into uh, the, uh, the evaluation and analysis process. Uh, we see the provision of good quality information and advice on company intranets um, that is not generic, it's tailored to different audiences. So if you're an employee, you can find out how to request an adjustment. If you're a manager, you can find out how to make one. Um, we see fast track referrals for things like musculoskeletal conditions, mental health conditions. Um, and for anybody really who knows what they want, so going back to Graham's point about making it easier for managers just to say yes and make an adjustment rather than going through the bureaucratic process. Um, and also we're seeing increasing use of passports, which I think, again, it might have been Graham who talked about that, a mechanism whereby employees can kind of document the adjustments that they have and that will go with them if they move around the organisation, or they can share that with a new manager so that they don't have to start that process of explaining and, and renegotiating the adjustments that they need. So terminology, we're starting to see a shift. Reasonable adjustments, um, we saw um, with legislation, things like the UN uh, Convention. Um, there are some negative connotations with using uh, legal language. Graham touched upon the fact that it suggests that maybe people with disabilities are somehow inherently unreasonable. Um, but also, when you use legal terminology, it kind of suggests or implies that we will treat you, f we will treat you properly, um, and it's because we are legally obliged to do so, um, which is, of course, not the message that um, many of our members want to convey. Um, we've seen that move into workplace adjustments, which is about recognising actually this is a business process that is about giving people what they need. Um, and now we're starting to see um, even broader language and even sometimes moving away from the word adjustments um, completely. So I've heard Graham use the, the term democratising uh, the process uh, many times. We've heard um, reference to productivity tools and just simply this is the way that we work. So uh, much broader language. So finally, just in the, in the last minute that I have, um, those, we measure the experience pr primarily of companies in the UK. Many of our members are, are global, so um, the challenge then is kind of multiplied for these companies that work in multiple locations. So Shell have developed a, or in the process of rolling out a process that goes right across um, the companies, uh, the countries in which they operate. So a consolidated catalog of adjustments um, that anybody can request wherever they are in the world. Uh, the process is overseen by a site in Manila um, and it was piloted in Europe and in uh, North America and is now being rolled out in regional waves across the rest of the world. Standard Charter um, similarly have a framework that covers the whole of uh, the business across 63 markets, one single framework, one process. Um, key decisions made locally so that um, there is a lack of bureaucracy, decisions can be made uh, quickly and one of the key things that they found most of their operation is in um, developing countries or low-income uh, countries and it's there where they've seen the most uh, the most positive impact because these are countries where there is no expectation legal requirement or culture um, for adjustments to be made um, whereas in the States or somewhere like the UK if you've got a back problem you'll probably let your company know about it so it's had a real transformative effect uh, in those countries where there isn't that uh, framework in place. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brendan. I think you touched on very many important issues, but uh, just want to, because I know that BDF helps really managers to have, a, I think, very good, good guides also for managers, because you said managers oftentimes lack the confidence to, to work on reason adjustment or, or disability issues in general. So I know that BDF is doing really good work there. And, and the, the, the point about language, very interesting. I, th I like this idea of productivity too, you know, to give it a more or less, I don't know, legal or neutral connotation, but making really about, okay, how do I make sure that I increase the productivity um, of my workers? And not only the workers with disabilities. No? And I saw on the last slide on Standard Charter that they also in their policy cover people with family responsibilities or, or pregnant women and so on. So as, as, and, and it's the same with accessibility, right? Reasonable accommodation, they benefit not only people with disabilities, but they benefit all. Um, so thank you very much for all the pen to all the panelists. Let them give them a round of applause in addition to the individual <laughs> round.
and special thanks to all of you for being on time, <laughs> which means that we have an hour uh, sufficient time for, for questions and answers, and I hope uh, some of you have, uh, have some questions already at hand, so please go ahead. Maybe you could just um, uh, say your name and who the question is directed to, and we'll take, let's say, the first three now, and then second round. Yeah, the gentleman there. Hi, good evening. My question is generally for the panel, but more specifically for those working in uh, South Asia. Uh, we spoke a lot about supply side and demand side, but is there any way of monitoring uh, post-job retention? Uh, because, you know, people might actually place persons with disabilities in the job, but one month or two months or three months down the line, uh, they might not be retained or they might be turned over. So is that some way of monitoring it or is there a way of enforcing it somehow? Thank you. Um, I think a question here in the front. Um, I actually have two questions. It has to do with uh, Mr. Khan. Um, how did you promote the job event? Because uh, in Europe, you use, use social media, and I was quite curious for that. Um, and in, in regard to Joseph Jones, uh, what is actually the standpoint uh, by Harkin uh, in, in regard to quota? Because we see that a lot in Europe. Uh, and I'm curious what's your view on that. OK, thank you very much. There were two questions. So we already have three for the moment. I'll come to me later. Just to say. So maybe we just answer the, the first round of questions. South Asia. So that would be Mortesa or Monica, who wants to talk about retention of people with disabilities or any other panelists? Sure. Um, so uh, it's a very important question you raised about retention. Um, I can say what we did uh, following up from our job fair, because indeed we wanted to make sure that the impact was sustainable, is um, within our members we have a lot of, again, the NGO partners who are with us to form a committee who is now following up with them on a regular basis. Um, that seems to be sort of one way to do it, is to keep the regular communication going. And also to talk to the companies uh, as well uh, to, to make sure that if there are any challenges or to, uh, any issues that need to be identified. So just really to keep that conversation going um, and that follow up uh, even after the job is delivered is I think uh, at least the way we're pursuing it. And it's only been a few months so maybe I'll have a better answer for you later but that's sort of what we're pursuing. Um, and the other question that you had for me in terms of promoting the uh, job fair uh, well, we were very uh, fortunate, I think, because of having uh, these government representatives who, who were our chief guests, that a lot of media showed up. Um, we were covered in the daily newspapers as well as the, uh, the TV channels gave us pretty good coverage, like a couple of minutes in their news cycle. Um, so I think uh, having a few people who the media take interest in uh, to be present at the fair, for example, really helped us to increase the profile and make sure the right people were uh, watching it and tuned in. Um, with uh, DRPI Aware, uh, we, uh, we uh, endeavor to follow the employees in their work positions and follow up with them regularly to, to uh, hopefully see that they uh, stay in their job positions. And what we discover often is that uh, there might be some challenges around the job fit or the inappropriate job accommodations that are in place. And then when we have the conversation with the employee and with the employer, then we're able to find that mismatch again and then hopefully bring that person back into a much more comfortable work environment. Sometimes it also involves speaking with the families um, that they are comfortable uh, allowing their children or their family members to be employed and engaging them in the fulsome conversation. Um, with respect to your other question uh, around social media, social media is used really widely for by our uh, work placement coordinators by using WhatsApp lists and Facebook channels in order to advertise the particular jobs that are doing. Um, we've also worked with job placement agencies that uh, um, are primarily online and really discovered like with much of um, uh, social media, it's easy to do say like 
and it's easy to get very many views, but translating that into real work for real people and sustainable uh, jobs is really quite a challenge and does still require the, the human personal touch. Um, anybody else on retention, Graham? Well, I was going to do retention. <laughs> I do quotas and promotion. Can I do those two? Okay, so um, just on promotion, I think it's a really good point that you can't just plop a process and policy in place within an organisation. You need to tell your people. So just a couple of observations on that. At Channel 4, we created uh, what we call our Disability Hub, which is a space on the intranet, which is everything to do with disability in the workplace. And it's like a one-stop shop for advice for managers, employees, etc. And then in terms of social media, Channel 4, as part of its remit set by the UK government, is responsible for creating change within the TV industry in the UK. So that's where we use social media externally to promote things like, for example, the employment guide. And then just quickly on quotas, um, again, this is going to sound like another plug. It's not. If you look at my LinkedIn page, I've, I've written a blog on this because I did some research a year or so ago. Uh, which has picked up on a couple of other papers. And the sad fact is that there is absolutely no evidence that quotas have any positive outcomes whatsoever. The UK is unusual in not having a quota system. We got rid of it about 15, 20 years ago. Um, and the, the evidence would suggest that quotas can actually drive the wrong behaviours. Pseudo jobs is easier to pay the fine. The people who are actually recipients of the fine money are generally those who are supporting disabled people. So it's in their best interest if disabled people don't get jobs. You get the picture. Um, so targets, fantastic. Yet yeah, we should all have targets in terms of the number of disabled people we employ. But I don't believe quotas are the right way to do it. Joseph, what, what's your view from the S on quota legislation? <laughs> well, I, I, I appreciate the question because you're right. We, we see constantly in other parts of the world that that is, um, that is a way that has been uh, embraced. Um, generally, uh, elected officials in the United States um, have um, shied away from, from, from doing something to their corporate partners that would tie their hands, so to speak. And so what we've seen is um, you know, not a requirement to hire, but a requirement, or a certain number, but a requirement that you not discriminate against those who, who do have a disability. So what you've seen following that is a evolution, because competition is really big in, in American business, like all business, but the political side of the United States also sees business as really important and loves to embrace that, that sort of competition. So what was a accommodation for one became a accessibility for most to now it's a it's a fight for having a cool and beautiful workplace and so each company has kind of done their individual um, push to do that and that's driven the number of employees that would want to come work there whether they have a disability or not um, the customers who come to those types of businesses and getting those recognitions of being an inclusive and innovative workplace has driven really the um, the move for some of those those organizations to hire more persons with disabilities without there being a quota uh, in place because it's now become not only the the right thing to do but it's also profitable for them um, and so we, we've seen this all in a, a different light so um, we continue to look at those things but uh, definitely haven't taken a stance on pushing for quotas hope that's helpful well, thank you um, let's take another three questions yes please Hello, it's Mary Bartolomucci from the Accessibility Directorate of Ontario, Canada. Um, Mike, I, I've heard uh, both here and in our work that one of the largest barriers is attitudinal barriers of employers. Um, and I guess this is a question for anyone on the panel. Um, do you have any information or any experiences on direct work with employers to address ad uh, attitudinal barriers beyond creating policy, do you have any specific initiatives or things that you might have worked on that have actually enabled the, the removal of that barrier, or at, least the, or at least the reduction of that barrier in your workplace? Okay, thank you. Bob? Well. Yeah, and just in, in follow-up to that question, uh, I'm Bob Ransom uh, from the Ethiopian Center for Disability and Development in Ethiopia. And our organization is supporting the Ethiopian Business and Disability Network. And one of uh, the strategies that we have been found, that we have found effective to build 
business confidence and to address the attitudinal issues that were just raised is through internships. And I'm wondering if uh, any of the panelists have had any experience in placing uh, persons with disabilities on short-term uh, one or three month internships in uh, private sector companies because what we've discovered is it's a great way for the companies to get to know somebody at no cost and uh, the uh, retention or employment rate is quite high so I don't know if uh, in other parts of the world there's been any experience with uh, these kinds of internships. Okay, thank you. There was another question over there. Yeah, please. Um, it's Liang Lin from China, uh, Changchun University. Um, I saw. I want to ask a question to Jogan Mazin. I'm sorry, I can not spell very well. Yes, yeah, okay. so you. Yeah. <laughs> because I saw you are uh, working in the international labor organization, which is uh, uh, international organi organizations around the world. So China uh, these days uh, want to encourage more and more youngsters to work in the international organizations. And uh, so we pay more attention to their capabilities. Uh, to improve their capabilities can be work in the international organizations. And also, uh, nowadays, we invest a lot to on, the, um, the, on the capabilities of disability students, uh, graduate university students. So my question is, uh, university graduates or people with the disabilities can represent in the international organizations? Uh, if so, what, what uh, qualifications are they need? Okay, thank you very much. Um, who would like to take the question on attitudinal barriers of employers? Very, very easy one. <laughs> Brent, <laughs> maybe. I'm happy to take the first, the first stab at that. And actually, as I was listening to the first question and thinking through your question about internships, one of the one of the most effective ways to address um, an attitudinal barrier is oftentimes that is uh, derived from uh, an employer not having any experience of working with people with disabilities and that's how kind of negative assumptions can often be formed so actually making sure that an employer actually gets to meet people with disabilities is probably the most effective way of addressing an attitudinal barrier which uh, kind of internships can be a good way of doing that um, and we've certainly seen good examples I mean, just last week I read about one of our members, Sedexo, who had done, uh, formed a partnership with one of their suppliers, Johnson & Johnson, um, to facilitate uh, sponsored or paid internships. Um, so that's a great way of getting uh, candidates into, uh, into the workforce, giving them skills, experience, but it also has the uh, effect of upskilling the people around them as well. So um, I think that's a great way of kind of addressing those two. And just a last point on um, attitudinal barriers. I think. Our research shows that um, raising the visibility of disability in an organisation uh, can have an impact uh, on people's attitudes. Um, so raising the visibility of role models within the organisation, so um, prominent uh, or senior figures who are prepared to talk openly about having a disability, which will often be a non-visible condition. Um, and we've also seen an increase in quite innovative and an imaginative uh, video campaigns. So organisations like Barclays, like Fujitsu, like Shell, have all developed videos of their employees, existing employees, working across a range of locations and a range of um, roles in terms of seniority, talking about this is me, this is who I am, this is the job I do, and by the way, I have um, you know, depression or dyslexia or something like that. So um, those have proved to be quite uh, impactful. Thank you, Bryn. Anybody else? Graham? Thank you. Um, internships, uh, I think probably the two best things the UK government has done, one is the access to work scheme, which reduces the fear of cost for employers in terms of making adjustments. The second one is the supported internship scheme. It's phenomenally successful. You, you take young people, uh, disabled young people, and you provide them with the support, and you find a work placement for them, and the employer doesn't have to spend any money it basically just normalises disability in place and gives a fantastic opportunity to a disabled young person. I think the, the um, going on to attitudinal barriers, uh, I think the, the trick here is to show people it's not us and them, it's all of us. You know, it, anybody says they're not disabled, they're telling a lie, because actually they're not disabled yet. Um, so it's, it's breaking down that us and them thing. 
employee networks are a great way of doing it for employee resource groups, which are open to both disabled and non-disabled employees to share experience, common life experiences, learn from each other. And also the Financial uh, Standards Authority in the UK is running a reverse mentoring scheme, which is a great way for junior people who are different within the organisation, be it because of a disability, the colour of their skin, whatever, to actually mentor um, a senior stakeholder within the organisation so that senior person gets an insight into their life and the barriers and the challenges that they face. So a great way of actually changing senior attitudes. Or to internships? So, Bob, if I may answer your question on internships with a twist. <laughs> to also maximize partnerships. So I'll give you an example that, if you remember, part of the mission of the Confucius Institute, so this isn't quite Disney, but I'll bring it full circle to Disney. Our goal and mission is to teach Chinese language and culture uh, within our area, and that's the role of the 500 Confucius Institutes. But we also embrace Chinese sign language, and so we provided an opportunity for a professor who is deaf to come to a school for the deaf in the United States to teach Chinese sign language to our students, which then contributed to her becoming a Harkin Fellow with Joseph at the Harkin Institute the following year through the internship opportunity that she had with us, which then led to Dr. Amy Knopf having a Harkin Fellowship also. And Joseph, thankfully, uh, through his participation in one of our study abroad, our education abroad programs is on the, he's on the board of our Confucius Institute. So this has evolved then to working with our colleague from Changchun University to establish internships in our schools for the deaf across the United States where they come to teach Chinese sign language. The goal with that is not only increasing their American sign language skills and their English skills, but a core competency that is really required within the multinational organizations, which is global competencies. And so that's the opportunities that we are collaborating through our multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary partnerships that we have for the internships for these young people who will come and spend a year and then go back to China and have a level of skill sets and competencies that they would not have otherwise been afforded had they stayed in China. So it's maximizing partnerships for internships, and so not just in the multinational organizations, but how do we prepare them for that next step of an internship, hopefully paid in the following years uh, as we advance their knowledge and skill sets. Thank you. Okay, um, I guess I have to take the question because it was directly <laughs> directed to me about um, employment of, of graduate or young professionals in international organizations. And I would say international organizations, including organizations, agencies of the United Nations system like the ILO, uh, we face similar problems like in private companies because we need to make sure that people we work with uh, understand what is disability about, what, is, does it, does, what does disability in 21st century mean, um, are we, do we have accessible premises, is our communication accessible, uh, what kind of policies and procedures do we have to do we have in place to accommodate people with disabilities if needed? So of course we try and, inter and of course international labor organization our mandate is to promote decent work for all. We of course very much cl work with our human resources department, but we face similar challenges uh, like colleagues in, in the private sector where we have to educate, sensitize the HR colleagues on and, and those who are working on, on the recruitment where we have recruitment panels, so we need to sensitize those who are on recruitment panels. We need to make sure that our website is accessible. Um, luckily at the ILO we have a reasonable accommodation reserve. We have um, in our job vacancies we welcome also ap applications from, from disabled um, job candidates. Um, so, I mean, of course, I, I work in the ILO. I know that there are quite some challenges. We, at least in the disability team, we always try to get a qualified uh, disab disabled colleague, and especially also through internships, because it's kind of a low threshold um, to get, get people into the organizations. Um, I know from, from other parts of the UN, for example, UN volunteers last year, I think they started a, um, like a disability specific component in their volunteers program that is <coughs> yeah, specifically targeting um, volunteers who already have like 
one, two years of work experience and placing them in other UN agencies around the world. Um, and I know I've I just um, talked to the person there in charge and they're looking right now for 10 people with disabilities who could then gain some uh, initial work experience in, in international organization or in, in the UN system. And I know uh, because China, uh, according to my knowledge, they also ch started recently uh, funding the so-called Junior Professional Officer Program, JPO program. I was a JPO myself, funded, funded by Germany, and I know, and I'm very happy that my donor country uh, started also now um, or hired the first uh, uh, JPO with an obvious disability just recently. And now I know that China is is, uh, is putting quite some money into getting JPOs, the junior professional offices, into the UN system. And, and that's an opportunity to also tell the Chinese government, make sure that um, that people with disabilities, graduates with disabilities, are, are included in that program. Right? Um, but as I said, I mean, we're, we're constantly pushing and um, working with the Human Resources Department and uh, with, with those uh, departments in the ILO that are responsible for accessible, um, accessible premises, accessible communication and so on. But I think the UN can do better and, and I think, but there's, there's um, at least recognition of the fact that we can do better. and. Um, and just to mention that in, back in 2014, we did an internal survey at the ILO to find out how many people with disabilities actually work in our organization, because we don't ask, right? We don't usually ask, like, do you have a disability? And we are not, not allowed to. Um, and it was quite interesting. Of course, those who responded to the survey, which is, of course, not a very representative uh, answer, because those who are more inclined to... to, to uh, answer to disability related questions. They either have a disability or are very much interested in the topic. But out of those respondents, there was about one quarter of the ILO staff responded to the survey. And out of these uh, respondents, we saw that about 15%, more or less, we would qualify as a person with, with a disability, but most of these disabilities are not visible, obvious, right? But we can definitely also do a better job in, in getting more people with obvious visible disabilities into the organization, because that, uh, and relating also to, to Bob's question, if you have vis like people with visible disabilities working in your organization, that changes the, the attitudes throughout the organization, right? Um, but as I said, UN volunteers, the JPO program funded by China, I think that are very good entry points for young graduates from China. So now, any other questions? We can take another round, I think. Please. Hello. Um, I'm Fabrizio Fe. I come from Italy. I'm president of Glatenet and uh, Vice President of ASPD. I wanted to know from, from you uh, if you still uh, have a, a big differences uh, talking about uh, working uh, in uh, open labor market or sheltered workshops. Because sometimes we still have to fight a lot under this point of view uh, about inclusion of persons with disability in the workplace. And if uh, uh, the salaries are exactly the same, or there are still uh, uh, people that are paid just with pocket money. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for now? No. Okay. Who wants to take on the question about sheltered workshops? Graham? Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, protected employment or sheltered workshops was something that the UK got rid of uh, about five years ago, maybe a bit longer, and that was at the um, that was after pressure from disabled people's organisations themselves. Um, there's there's two sides to the argument, and I think people are passionate about both sides. The argument that prevailed in the UK is that having sheltered or protected um, employment was actually stopping disabled people entering mainstream employment. Um, it was seen as an inhibitor. The counter argument is that for some people it will be very difficult for them to enter mainstream employment and therefore we need a safety net for them. I take, I go down the middle on this. Um, 
I believe that social enterprises and community interest organisations could be the middle way. I've seen this work very well in Asia. Um, I attended work, spoke at Workability Asia last year, and there were some fantastic examples of how, um, in Singapore, for example, social enterprises weren't sheltered um, employment as such. They were actually providing real jobs for real customers, but they were focused around disabled people. I thought that's a really great example. So I think it's really finding a balance that protects those who are most vulnerable or most least likely to enter employment, whilst not acting as an inhibitor for most disabled people who would be perfectly capable and could have fantastic careers in mainstream employment. Thank you, Ray. I would just uh, add also that, I mean, I mean, it's quite clear in the, in the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, it talks about inclusion in the open labour market. I think we should always try to exploit all the available supports that are available uh, to make sure that sheltered employment, uh, protected employment, uh, as soon as possible becomes an issue of, of the past. Yes, please. Uh, the thing is, actually, I'm from the Netherlands, and uh, we have currently the discussion about people in sheltered workplaces who are actually going down in wages to 70% of minimum wage, so the minimum wage of... And the whole discussion is, and that is quite interesting in, in follow-up in, in this, because the government says, yeah, but... Uh, they get paid uh, uh, the minimum standards to survive in the Netherlands, and that is 70% of minimum wage. Um, and in regard to the UNCRPD, we say, hey, this is in, in, in contradict with Article 27. And the whole discussion there is actually that uh, in the Netherlands, the government is trying to keep on trying to prove that they're right even while they're not paying fairly, uh, which is an interesting discussion, and especially also to follow for ILO, because if, uh, if that works, and if the government can say, okay, we can do this within CRPD, then there is a real big issue for all the people in social enterprises with li limited skills, uh, because then they get very, very underpaid instead of underpaid. I'm pretty sure that the CRPD committee that would then assess the state report of the Netherlands would have uh, very strong opinions about that, <laughs> which would also be in line in the, with, the, with the ILO position. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> Any other questions? Well, if not, then uh, let me thank you very much for being here, participating so actively, and again, special thanks for the panelists. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>